welcome to our April edition of Sports Highlights on the Road here in Hampton at Fort Monroe. Greg Picaveras along with Ray Price and I are with us for Sports Highlights on the Road. Our show in April airs on Mondays at 7 a.m., 2 p.m. and 7 p.m., weekends at 9 a.m. on Cox Cable 47, 507 and at PSTV.com and YouTube, of course. A pleasure to join by Lee Tolliver. Lee Tolliver outdoors, of course. Been with the pilot since 1976, retired. Good to see you. Nice to see you too, man. Appreciate you having me. How did it all get started from Kellum High School, I guess? Uh, my senior year of high school, I was a correspondent for the, uh, for the Virginia Beach Beacon, and they offered me a job as a copy boy after I graduated, and I just um, I, I kept working with my writing with the sports guys and doing my other work, and eventually became a staff writer, and um, 43 years later, uh, took a buyout and it was a it was a great career. It really was. Now, before we talk about fishing, primarily in outdoors and salt water and fresh water, you've covered a lot of sports over the years. Oh yeah, uh, mostly high school. Did a f little bit of college, uh, especially college field hockey. Back when ODU was the top team in the nation, that was part of my beat. Um, I, I basically got to do a lot of the the women's sports because the guys on the staff at the time <laughs> they just didn't really think much of women's sports and they needed somebody to cover them and I was like I'll do them and um, working with the ladies was always an absolute pleasure they appreciated any coverage they could get and I gave them a lot of coverage and um, they were just fun to work with and uh, I, I gained a lot of appreciation for the fact that the women in sports they work just as hard as the guys and, and all that so um, foot, I always helped out with football and basketball but um, the women's sports and uh, soccer and field hockey and stuff, those were my those were my main beats. Especially those national championship teams that Marianne Stanley had at Old Dominion. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. Very good. Talking to Lee Tolliver right here from the formerly the pilot, was with them since the mid-1970s. Let's talk about fishing and outdoors. Freshwater, salt water, where should we begin? Uh, let's go with freshwater because uh, this is Early spring is a great time for freshwater fishing. The, the bass are really turned on, crappie are t turned on, cat fishing is real good, um, uh, bluegill are starting to move into the shallows. It, it's just uh, the variety of species that you can catch is, is just fantastic. And this is known as a, a saltwater area because we're surrounded by saltwater, but in, in actuality, the freshwater fishing around here and, and within 100 miles of here. Is, is fabulous. It's really, really good fishing. So, One note about, before we talk about freshwater, tell the folks exactly where we're at right now at Fort Monroe Pier. Uh, we're at Fort Monroe Pier. This is, uh, this is close to the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, James River spills out over here. Um, and the funny thing is, a freshwater species, uh, blue catfish, that was introduced by the game department several decades ago to uh, give anglers more of a variety, They've proven to be very adaptive to different salinity levels. And with all the rain we've been having, they're actually catching blue catfish at the James River Pier. You know, the old, the old bridge that they left part of the road there, it's, it's a fishing pier now. And they've been, they've been catching fish there since, since in, in February, in March. Very so, nice, you learn something every time talking to Lee Tolliver at Greg Bick on Twitter. And back to the freshwater before we go back to salt water. It's amazing. I live across here from a, a man made lake in my neighborhood, but I've seen eels in there. Mm -hmm. I've seen huge snapping turtles that I've caught. Um, I've had bass bite bread. Yeah. It's amazing what a lake evolves into. Oh, yeah. And those, those kind of community neighborhood lakes are basically just water drainage basins, and birds eat fish and they populate those bodies of water by doing what nature does after you've eaten something. Yeah. So they, they populate, they self-populate, and then sometimes some of the guys that live on those lakes, they'll fish somewhere else and they'll bring their fish back to put up in those little lakes. Those neighborhood ponds are, um, they're a gem because not very many people can fish them. They're not fish very hard. And if you have access to one, there can be some remarkable, especially if it's been around several years, there's some remarkable fishing to be had in those places. And you don't need a lot of equipment. You get a bamboo pole and a line and some bread and go fishing. Bob, bobber, a hook, and, a, and a, a worm, and 
I mean, that's how most fishermen got started, was catching bluegills on a cane pole with a bobber and a worm. That's it. Talking to Lee Tolliver right here, formerly with the pilot. Lee, talk about some of the highlights that have stood out for you, both with freshwater and saltwater, because you've covered tournaments as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I grew up on Back Bay freshwater fishing, and as uh, when I took over the outdoor writer's job 20 years ago, um, I, had to, I had to learn and adapt to the saltwater scene. And it's amazing how the two can be inter intertangled because some of the techniques you use for freshwater fishing work very well for like puppy drum and speckled trout and flounder and stuff. So it's, you know, a fisherman's a fisherman. They're, they're going to they're gonna try to catch fish and, and, and they're going to enjoy the whole process of it. So. Right, but the guys that go up the boat, they do the deep sea fishing. Oh, yeah. I've covered some of the tournaments. And, and you know, the big money stuff with the big giant... 60 foot million dollar yachts and all that stuff it's it's interesting it's not my cup of tea but it's it's interesting and i've gone on some of the tournaments and gone out 70 miles off the coast to catch tuna and stuff and it's it has it's it has its appeal it's not my favorite thing in the world to do but if i have an offer to go on a tuna trip I'll go, because <laughs> it's fishing. And there's nothing like seeing the water change colors, blue and green. Oh, when you get that marlin or tuna. Oh, when you get out to blue blue water, it's it's just it's a whole nother world. It really is. And when you're in the Gulf Stream, it can be 60 degrees when you leave R Rudy Inlet or something, and then you get out there, and the Gulf Stream is so much warmer. It's it's 10 degrees warmer out you know around you. So it's um, but the the life out there, it's. It's amazing the things you see. D oh, yeah. Big turtles, sharks. It's 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 an amazing experience to be fighting a tuna and see three or four sharks. You're getting ready to gaff that tuna and bring it in the boat and three or four sharks are around and they're trying to get that tuna and you're trying to get it in the boat quick. It's it's uh it's amazing. It's just it's a it's amazing what fishing brings to to somebody. Just what all the nature. What type of bait do they bite normally? What tuna? For the tuna, yeah. Tuna, they're using uh, ballyhoo, which is a um, it's a small fish about this big, and they just rig them up with a hook and and they troll them. And sometimes they'll use lures along with the ballyhoo, and sometimes they'll just use lures. But um, most of the time, most guys are using ballyhoo. Talking to Lee Tolliver right here at Greg Bick on Twitter with Ray Price on our April edition of Sports Highlights on the road here, beautiful Fort Monroe Pier. For those of you that grew up in the area right near the Chamberlain, the old Chamberlain as well, just a great view. Best kept secret right here. It's an amazing place, isn't it? Really is. And all the history, I mean the battery and stuff right there with the guns and all, it's uh, it's an amazing place. And a good place to good place to come do a little fishing. Now let's talk about the pier for a second. People always think when you go to, let's say, the old Lynn Haven Pier or Ocean View Pier, you have to go to the furthest point to catch the biggest fish. Is that true or is it halfway through or whatever? Uh, nine times out of ten, the bigger fish are going to be where the deepest water is. So uh, if you go down to the outer banks of the piers there, um, the, the guy, the drum fishermen are always at the end of the pier. Now you can, you can catch them you know halfway through the pier and stuff but typically typically you want to be in the deepest water that's providable so what about crabs crabbing is uh crabbing has been amazing the, the past few years from from the piers and from the from the beach and stuff so um cr crabbing is one of the things that people people neglect to pay attention to because it's a lot of fun it's relaxing and you throw your crabs in a bucket and you go home and cook them and peel them and have a great old time. Right. If you're lucky enough to catch a flounder while you're doing your crabs, you can have stuffed flounder. So There you go. Or go to a good restaurant and get it too. <laughs> Talking to Lee Tolliver right here from Fort Monroe here. Talking outdoors, talking fishing, talking everything too. One thing that's always baffled me is the citation limits. Let me explain why. That we can eat shrimp this big. We can eat scallops, you know, the size of a quarter. But why is there a citation on fish when really it's free, I mean, why is it got to be a certain size for a flounder? If it's one inch off, it's you can't eat it. Well, it's it's a, a management technique to help preserve the species because um, there didn't used to be a limit on gray trout, and people would go on the head boats and, and just catch coolers full of gray trout, no matter what the size was. And you can't you can't keep you can't find gray trout anymore. So it's a it's a it's a method to it's a method to 
preserve the species is what it is. Right. Talking to Lee Tolliver and the different types of fishing too. I mean, for beginners, for ones that are seasoned veterans as well, they have to always keep an eye on that. On a pier, it's different. Usually, when you go to a pier, the fishing license is taken care of yeah. by the management team. But uh, when you go freshwater fishing, a lot of times with a boat, you do need a... You've got to have a license, license yeah. Why is that? Um, it's a tax. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's basically what it is. It's a tax to use the resource. Right. It's like a revenue base, too. All right. We're going to come back with part two of our segment with Lee Tolliver. We're going to talk about how the newspaper business that he worked in so long has changed so much from basically using a typewriter to laptops and computers to mostly online right now and talk more about fishing, freshwater, and saltwater on our April edition of Sports Highlights on the road. Stay tuned. Fitness with Alexis. Tune in weekdays 6.30 a.m., Mondays 7.30 a.m., 2.30 p.m., and 7.30 p.m. Watching NNPS TV. Catch sports highlights on Mondays at 7, 2, and 7, and on Saturdays and Sundays at 9 a.m. Visit us online at NNPSTV.com to view all your favorite episodes. NNPS TV, watching education happen. And welcome back to our April edition of Sports Highlights, our second segment, Sports Highlights on the Road from Fort Monroe. Greg Picabaris along with Ray Price and our featured guest for this April show, Lee Tolliver, who worked for the pilot for several decades, talking fishing, talking outdoors, and uh, beautiful view of that uh, Red Cross boat, Lee, and that's been a big uh, sight to see, especially during COVID. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, it was amazing the, the job that the Navy did with getting that ship prepared and, and supplied and ready to go up to, to New York in case they needed it because they were they were hospitals were full. I mean it's I mean it's just it's just amazing. And there's one on the West Coast too. So uh, our ability, this this government's ability to send that ship anywhere in the world to to help people and stuff is just it just it blows my mind. It really does. And thank you to all the frontline workers doing the COVID vaccinations, all several of them as well. Well when you talk about um, fishing in the different levels of fishing it really is something for everyone because a beginner or a veteran guy like uh like back in the day the tackle box that show you don't have to be you know a pro to fish anyone can fish anyone can fish and um you don't have to you don't have to be real hardcore about you know i've got to catch fish i've got to catch fish you, uh, that's the thing i like to preach to people is that Fishing is, is about the experience and being out in Mother Nature and stuff. Catching fish is just the bonus. Right. At least it is to me. But there are people who are so hardcore that if they don't catch fish, 
they're not real happy. Um, oh my and, goodness! Hey, I love catching fish myself, but if I go out and I don't, I can't tell you how many times I went out to do a, a fishing story and we didn't catch anything. And when you got to write a story about a certain fish and you didn't catch one, <laughs> it makes it tough. It makes it tough, but. Just being out with Mother Nature on the water and, and observing things, it's um it's a gift. It's just a gift. It really is. The fresh outdoors is the is the one that supersedes all the factors, but fishing is a lot like basketball and assist, you help get the point. When you score it, you make the point. Um, same thing for fishing too is you can have all the preparation have all the fun you might not make the catch of the fish you want but at least you're having fun doing it that's a bizarre analogy Greg yeah <laughs> but I love it it's uh it's 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 a good point right you're you're gonna increase your chances of catching by doing all the the prep work and making sure your line is is good and your your hooks are sharp and and getting ready to go. I mean, if you're going to go fishing, you might as well increase your odds as much right. as you can. So, and and the, the bait and tackle shops they'll help they'll help beginners with all of that. And the beginner, I, I always tell people go to uh, go to one of the fishing club meetings and and ask questions. And those guys those guys love to share their information and they'll they'll take you out fishing and show you what to do. I mean, it's. If you want to learn how to fish, there's a lot of opportunities around. Because there's nothing worse than getting a tangled line. I'm sorry, that's like the worst feeling. That can ruin your day. Uh, it's ruined many a day. Yes. <laughs> Trust me, especially when you're using bait casting equipment. You know, you, you throw it out and it gets bird's nest in the reel and uh, you got to pick it all out and you, you waste 15 minutes and it doesn't do much for your mood. Right. Switching gears a little bit to hunting real quick. As I was driving here this morning to Fort Monroe, in my neighborhood, I saw a giant deer. I mean, deer that a lot of people would go hunting. It is just, that is bizarre too, that in your own suburban neighborhood, you can see deer that a lot of hunters would like to shoot out in the country, out in Emporia and places like that. Tell us about the whole, the deer and the hunting thing. Deer are, are amazingly adaptable to uh when their habitat changes, um, there's a Fairfax Park that has the that has all the the interstate system around it. Fairfax Park, right in the middle of Fairfax, is got hundreds of deer in it. Um, so that's deer are hugely adaptable to to anywhere they can hide, have a place to hide at night and stuff. They're very adaptable. There's I wouldn't be surprised if there's a few small deer on on this fort. Right. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Now, speaking of fishing boats, there's a fishing boat out there right now, you know? That's a commercial guy. Yeah. Um, he is probably going after, let's see, April, he's probably, he's probably going after Croker or something like that. Yeah. Probably going to run his nets. But, because these seafood places that sell seafood to the public, they have to get them from guys like him right yeah exactly yeah because that's how they get all the fish and you know you see the red snapper i remember growing up as a kid we went to florida and our friend tommy would say to my mom and dad make sure you get red snapper mm -hmm. red snapper was a big deal back in the early 80s it seems like it's more widespread now but talk about why people like red snapper so much because uh, it's really good yeah <laughs> it's just a nice white flaky delicious fish there's a lot of fish out there like that um, but red snapper is just a really, really good fish, and you can cook it so many different ways. Um, people, when they cook fish, have a tendency to add too many sauces or whatever. <laughs> just, just give me, just give me the fish. Yeah. And red snapper, I've only had it a couple times, but it is, it's remarkably good. You're right because I like to use lemon on everything. Now lemon is kind of a neutralizer, but you start putting too many sauces and seasonings, and you're not eating fish anymore. No, and I, I make my own blackening seasoning, and when I use it on fish, I just just a hint of it because I don't want to. I'm going to eat fish. I want to eat. I want to taste the fish. If I eat steak, I want to taste steak. Right. So, 
I don't I don't want to mask it up with a bunch of stuff. Right. Talking to Lee Tolliver right here. All types of things outdoors, fishing, a little deer, a little everything out here. Fresh and salt water. Beautiful Fort Monroe Pier. Sports highlights on the road in April. Again, thank you to all the teachers and the staff for making it happen this school year. And what about shrimp and scallops? I mean, where do you go fishing for those? Uh, remarkably, um, Virginia Beach now has a pretty good shrimp industry. Um, the um, the game department, I mean, the um, VMRC is keeping it limited right now until they see how sustainable it is. But during the fall in Rudy Inlet, every day there's three sh- three boats that come in, and you can stand in line and get fresh shrimp caught a mile off the beach, take them home and put them in your steamer. I mean, it doesn't get any better than no. That. And fishing in the weather seem to go parallel hand in hand. Here we are in April, usually around May, June, July, August, September are really times where you see the public out in mass yeah. fishing. Yeah. But uh, really, this you can fish year round. Oh yeah, fishing. Uh, fishing this past winter was was really good in the in the inlets for um, puppy drum and speckled trout. We had a mild winter, so those fish didn't get stunned or anything. Um, and it was the water was warm enough that you could still get them to bite. It was slower fishing than it is the rest of the year, but it was still you could still fish all winter long. And then the guys that went off to, off the shore to um, to fish the wrecks, they were getting sea bass. And you go way out there, you catch tall tog and and tile fish. I mean, there's fishing. That's the wonderful thing about this area is that there's good fishing all year long. So I got to ask you this because your career was print journalism for the most part. You started off; it was the pilot, it was the Ledger Star. The pilot people they covered the South Side and they covered other state areas. The Daily Press, the Times Herald, they covered the peninsula. Now it's one big happy family. Uh, you're seeing less and less of the print. You're seeing it more geared toward online and online sales. It's geared geared toward sales. You're seeing limited staff. What is your thoughts now of the pilot in the print industry? It's a giant change that's happening to, to uh, newspapers all around the country, and it's it's really hitting the the uh, pilot and the daily press really hard since they were bought by Trib- Tribune and merged into what's now Virginia Media. They've been cutting back on staff. Uh, there's no longer a place to work. There's no buildings. The printing press um, they sold that. Um, it's just, it's a crying shame what's what's going on. Right, because at one time the Daily Press, they would print right there on Wark Boulevard, yeah. and then they out, did an outlet. What about the pilot? Weren't they on one time Greenwich Row? They had a plan yeah, out our, there. Our press was, well, well, actually, when I first started there, the press was actually at the Brambleton Avenue. Place. Right. And they bought the Brambleton Row property and started printing for a bunch of other companies and stuff. They did a lot of stuff other than just print the newspaper. But... That's been sold. The, the Daily Press's offices don't exist anymore. The pilot office of Brambleton is going to be condos here soon. Um, uh, they're letting people go like crazy, and, and people are realizing a lot of people are just leaving on their own. Um, I was told that three other people just left the, left the pilot, um, and they're not going to replace them. So it's hard to cover things like they need to be covered. I mean, when I. We used to have like 45 people on the sports staff. Yeah. Now there's five. Mm-hmm. Covered. We, we, I talk like I'm still working there. Yeah. But when you put 43 years of your life into a place, it's you're not, not, you're not going to let go. What was your first year? What was your last year? 1976 and then February of 19, I mean 2019 was my last year. And you were, as a, you were using a typewriter one time, correct? Yeah, when I first got there, we used the IBM Selectric typewriter, and you write your story, and you go over to this big, huge box, and you scan the story in, and it would go to a computer. Back when I first started, we still had the teletype machines from the AP and UPI and stuff. They would the stories, and then the ticker tape would come out to match the story. The editor would pick out which stories he wanted. We'd go back in the in the shop and load the ticker tape for that story in so it would go into what they called a computer back then. All right, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to go freshwater fishing for the first time and saltwater fishing, pier, boat, or offshore? Um, freshwater fishing, I would tell people to 
uh, just find a neighborhood lake, like where, where you live, or one of the Suffolk lakes owned by the city of Norfolk. Uh, get a bobber, can of worms, cane pole or something, and just sit on the bank and catch a few bluegill. It, it doesn't matter what size, just start learning how to do that. And then you'll bump into somebody that's launching their boat there, and you can start talking to people. Fishermen, overall, fishermen tend to be very, very helpful. Uh, for saltwater, the joy is you've got guide services. Uh, go out, go out with a guy, hire a guide, and get them to take you out, and they'll they'll tell you what the best chances of catching whatever species or whatever time of year it is. Get a guide and go out and, and do that, and join one of the fishing clubs, and um, become a member, and just learn. How about you? Do you still fish today? I do. And what do you love it like nobody does? <laughs> How often do you fish? Not as much as I'd like to. What about a nags head fishing? Uh, nags head fishing, um, I go down there sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly when I go down there, I go down there to go on a boat with some friends and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I'm not a big surf fisherman. I, I, my brother-in-law loves it, and I understand the appeal, and I'll do it. But I have just never... It's, there's so many different techniques for different kinds of fishing that you need to, to learn. and. At my age, you kind of have already adapted what your favorite things are to do. So right. if you have the time, you're probably going to go do those things. Yeah, there's nothing like catching a fish in Nags Head, surf fishing. Lee Tolliver, all the best to you. Thank you for your time, your talent, and your treasure. Having. Yes, for enlightening us about freshwater and saltwater fishing here in beautiful water country here in Hampton, the South Side, Virginia Beach, Nags Head, Ocean View. There's so many great places to fish, you know, lakes streams, rivers, everything. It's a fun, fun sport, and it gets you outdoors. So, hope you enjoyed our April edition of Sports Highlights. Thank you for watching all of our football games led by Ray Price. We've got it done, folks, for you, the public, for your viewing pleasure. For Ray Price and Lee Tolliver from Fort Monroe, I'm Greg Bicaveras. Thanks for watching our April show, and we'll talk to you soon.